Hi, everybody. It's T. Falcon Napier. Welcome to the Oracle of the Self. This is the Explorers Group Coaching Call. And as I've already said on several occasions, this isn't quite the call that I had mapped out for this particular series. So after I get back from uh, my journey abroad, we will um, reinitiate these calls with the way they're designed to be, which is really all about you guys filling out your own change grids and then um, looking at your own results. And then I'll read the, the results for you, or you can ask questions about it, or you can read it for me and I can let you know uh, how uh, how uh, good of a job you're doing on the reading side of things. So that's really what this is really all about. It's the Oracle of the Self, you talking to you about you. But somehow this became a rather in-depth training program and I'm perfectly happy with all that, but now I feel compelled to at least finish what we started. So there's a few little missing elements. Um, we certainly have not been going through this material in the sequential way that it's always been taught. Um, as you can imagine, there are dozens, well, there are hundreds of hours of uh, training in uh, change works and all things related to it, like mastery stream and pride based leadership and the accountable self and all those sorts of things. So there's hundreds of hours of, of stuff that you could be listening to. But when I think about that core training for someone to go through, usually people go through uh, change works essentials. No, uh, they go through mastering personal change first. Mastering personal change, I think, is either four or six hours, and it's all recorded. It's all up online. You guys can come to that whenever you feel so inclined. And then after you finish that, you go into ChangeWorks Essentials, and that's now getting into, uh, rather than a superficial kind of a reading or whatever, it's really saying like, now this is what's essential for you to know about how to read a change grid. Well, we're kind of beyond that because now I'm taking you guys into the more in-depth sort of stuff just to make sure that everything's been covered. So I'm hoping this doesn't uh, confuse anybody, leave anybody in the dust, but I want you to kind of know where this all has come from. Last time around, we kind of started at the end and I somehow started to show you guys the comprehensive adjective map um, and uh, some of the tools that go along with using that adjective map. So uh, that that's definitely a bit of a jump. Uh, so today I'm going to go back and we'll walk our way through this ending up at the adjective map, but, uh, but here it is. And then last little thing to connect the calls uh, together is I mentioned that if you were be being certified in change works or tension management or any of our, our programs, one of the things you have to go through is a section we call uh, comparative human typological analysis. And it instead of looking at how a model describes humanity, we look at all models who describe humanity. And uh, we start seeing increasing similarities among them. We start to shift onto different layers of the change grid because of the diagrams they're using and things like that. But, but what's important is that as you stumble across more models of human behavior, your awareness of influency in these principles of tension management and the change grid itself should enable you to overlay any model you stumble across that seems to make sense to you at the moment, you should be able to overlay it on the change grid so it will make even more sense. And uh, that means the change grid will add lots of additional uh, insights to that, that tool you've stumbled across. It also means that with any luck at all, that tool you've stumbled across will contribute something unique to our a growing body of knowledge around this whole world of tension management and the change grid. Uh, so that's a lot of words is getting things set up, but I just wanted to walk you through how this change grid ends up being built. Now, on a different call, I did explain to you that basically the change grid is a modified Cartesian coordinate system. So it has your basic X and Y axis. The X axis is here at the bottom, marked perceived ability, and the Y axis is up here at the top. Uh, that's uh, perceived challenge. So there you go. So the, that, that's the two. Now, it's modified because it's been rotated some 45 degrees um, clockwise. And uh, because we did that, um, we can create the master stream diagram. And we showed you guys that on a different call. So you do understand that as we go about applying these principles of tension management to something other than the oracle of the self, we become increasingly focused on how the tension is flowing 
instead of on simply how the tension is and where we might want it to be and how to move someone there. So instead of using it as for that kind of a descriptive uh, and uh, prescriptive kind of a tool, we instead want to talk about tension is a dynamic living actual thing. It's constantly flowing. There's not a single moment of your life when you don't have a certain level of tension existing in your body, even your body at rest has a certain level of productive tension, a certain level of energy uh, that's that's going on. As your thoughts change, your energy, etc., can also change and change very quickly. But now what's happening is that the tension is becoming more focused, or the attention rather, is becoming more focused on a particular situation that you're facing, a goal you're trying to work on, a problem you're trying to solve, whatever it happens to be. You're attention goes there. And as your attention goes there, the tension that you are feeling is going to meet you there, wherever it, it all happens to be on the change grid. So, uh, so that's why that's what the diagram is. That's why it's tilted. Now, as we've gone through this whole process of comparative human typological analysis, I love that phrase, I really should copyright that one too. Um, there is a little spreadsheet I just wanted to very quickly show you with any luck at all. I can find it fast. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Don't know. Don't know. Okay. Doesn't really matter. Basically what it is, it's, a, it's an Excel spreadsheet that lists all of the different models of human behavior that we have stumbled across and built any, um, in, in, any energy around. And that spreadsheet is divided into the number of types that model says exist in the world of human behavior. And so if we want to really have fun with it, we can say there are at least a couple of one type models. In a one type model, what the model proposer would be saying is that all humans are the same. That, um, you know, whether they're looking at it in totality or in certain certain elements, uh, there are some things we could say that says there is just one type and then one that one type is human. Now, inside of that one type, there are many, many subtypes, but ultimately we should never lose uh, sight of the fact that ultimately we are describing a single entity and that entity is a human being. There are other one type models that talk about that. Uh, they tend to be more on the philosophical and metaphysical side of things rather than on the logical, practical kind of thing. So there's a certain nobility to thinking about humanity as all being one and all that. But when it comes to uh, you know, practical life, uh, we see far more distinctions than that. And so, but that's what it's all about. Bottom line, we can look at this layer of the change grid, which is just saying like, forget everything we can overlay on it. Just keep in mind that there is always an interplay of these two perceptions to end up where you happen to be. All right, so the model that I thought was most important to integrate would be a model proposed in 1908 by Yerkes and Dodson. They called it at the time the inverted U theory. And if you look at their diagram, it would look like a bell curve. And the bell curve would basically show uh, the level of, um, now they didn't use the word tension, they used the word arousal at the time. So it was about the, the degree to which your senses are being activated. So they could draw a relationship between uh, productivity or performance, I think is what they actually called it, and uh, this level of arousal. And so they would say that you would have, again, it's a bell curve, that at low levels of arousal, you would have low levels of productivity, performance, I think it's performance. Um, and as you got to a moderate level of sensory arousal, you would reach top performance, forget what I'm drawing, and I'm just drawing for the hell of drawing over here. Um, and uh, if you got beyond that midpoint, then you would start experiencing a diminishing return on that. So greater levels of arousal do not equal greater levels of performance and productivity and all that. Uh, there comes a point in time where we receive or we, we um, enjoy the, you know, the optimal level. So that's what they just said it was a bell theory. And so they would basically say that when there is too much sensory arousal, you're in distress, 
That was how they characterized stress. And if you were at the lower end of that arousal, that's what we would call apathy. So it's like an inactive kind of thing, a low level of sensory involvement. And along the way, in the middle, you get the most, and they didn't use the word power, but they would call that optimum. And so right there, you kind of knew, all right, they're saying there are these three Kodak moments that we want to look at, ranging from too little arousal, that would be apathy, to too much arousal, that will be stress, let's change the language, too little tension gives us apathy, too much tension moves us up into stress. Even if we look at, uh, you know, use the word energy, when we're at a low energy state, uh, versus a very high energy state. And so that's where these come from. And in the middle, they'd slap whatever their version of power is. So we see this as being a continuum. Rather than there just being these three Kodak moments, we say, no, we can stop at any point along this continuum and see what's really going on as far as the energy the person is experiencing, the tension they're experiencing, uh, the you know, et cetera. Okay, so any questions about this particular diagram? Uh, do you kind of know what I'm talking about, see what I'm talking about? We're just saying that the way these two things combine, we end up in one of these five levels of productive tension. All right. So then we had to look at another layer, just say, well, you know, stress and power, these are all rather big wedges. Are we suggesting that someone who is at coordinates two, two in power, are having the exact same experience as someone who's at 11, 11 in power? Are we saying that one four in stress as the feels identical to one 12 in stress? Of course not. Um, as we move further and further away from the origin of the change grid, these levels of tension become more pronounced. They become more, um, uh, what do I say, more expressed, they become more, our word is intense. And so we need to then look at these intensity levels as we're, as we're looking out on them. David, you've just unmuted. Do you have something you want to throw in? Not yet. Okay. All right. So, so hopefully for everyone uh, uh, that's not new, this is a, a good review for you. A question has always come up about why are there all these different bands of intensity? Well, I just tried to kind of make them every two points along the stop. It didn't make much sense to put one right here between two and two because there's nothing inside of it. Maybe that would be zero uh, degree intensity, uh, but that would mess up my diagram. So I'm not going to bother doing that. Ah, maybe I will. I don't know. Uh, but one question that does puzzle people is, why is it that six and seven don't go all the way up grid and don't go all the way down grid? I know graphically it's because I'm confining things uh, to the square, but is there, a, is there a logical reason to that? And I believe it is because we are able to manage higher levels of intensity in our thoughts, feelings, behavior, et cetera, when we are in control of those thoughts, et cetera. So if you're in a stress response, it may very well be that the highest level of uh, intensity you can handle is a five. There's no way anyone could handle a stress of six or a stress of seven. But when you're out here in power, um, well, maybe you can, because this is fighting time. This is really going out there and putting things to the test. And so that's just my little conceptual thing around to be able to be this intense about something six or seven. Um, it has to be the situation plus your level of drive around it. Um, and so that's where we're getting to that energy. Okay. Uh, similarly, if you're too far down grid, I say the lowest level, uh, or rather the highest level of intensity you can experience in apathy would also be a five because you're already sound asleep, if not on the border of dead. You can't handle a six or a seven. You'd just be gone. So that's my concept behind behind this. Um, now, we've talked about this before. We've never really felt like the debate is over. We've also never felt like there's a need to finish that debate because how this layer is actually integrated and used is much simpler than all that would lead us to. It just basically says, 
when we're talking about these five levels of tension, can you feel that there is a difference in each of these little stopping points? And so this is a quiz question for all of you guys. Can you feel if you're looking at power stress? And again, remember, you know, every, all kinds of things about power and stress. This is where people are ready to take that immediate definitive action. Uh, this is, you know, where there's a sense of urgency, et cetera. Can you feel that a second degree uh, intensity in power stress feels very different than a sixth degree intensity in power stress? Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. And so that's that's the only thing I just want you to be able to say there are subtleties and nuances. And um, at a certain point, we have to recognize that doing a thorough job of reading a change grid requires equal uh, portions of intelligence and intuition. You got to know your stuff. You got to know these diagrams to help you understand the layout and start to actually see some of the subtleties. But ultimately, you've got to go into that intuition. You've got to go into that internal state and say, what's feeling right to me? You know, if we're working with a client, their words are only communicating a tiny fraction of the information that a trained professional is picking up in their dialogue. So, uh, and I'm, you know, I'm talking to the choir here when I look at who's on the call. You guys know that we pick up far more information about what our client is thinking and experiencing based on their tone of voice and based on cues they are revealing physically than the words themselves. In fact, if you go back to that study long ago that said we are uh, communicating information through three pathways, a physical pathway, a tonal pathway, and a verbal pathway. And if you look back to that study, you'd find out that uh, seven or eight percent of the information we are learning from another person at any given moment in time is something we are gathering from the words themselves. So it is how those words are spoken. So the tonality of them that gives us far more information and ultimately uh, being, you know, kind of cued into what they're doing physically is giving us even more um, depth of information than what we're really That's doing. one of the problems with remote coaching T is that when you're not physically in the same space as your client, you don't pick up a lot of those physical cues. Absolutely. It's also the challenge with working remotely or probably anything that we're trying to do remotely. Uh, at least we can kind of see part of the person, but we are not fully, um, well, we're not able to fully observe what's going on with their body. And so, for example, I know that if someone is tapping their foot rather quickly or bouncing their leg rather quickly, that's telling me something about the level of tension they're experiencing. And so their words could be saying to me, and if I'm watching them on a Zoom call, their words could be saying to me and their facial expressions could be saying to me, everything's just fine. It's really been a good day. Good things are happening. But what does that bouncing foot tell you? Tension that there's a lot more tension than they might be letting on. I can't see that on a call. And so I am operating uh, at a reduced, um, I want to say quantity, quality of the information. Um, yeah, there's tonality on the phone. I mean, in the old days, it'd just be on the phone. There's tonality. Uh, there are the words themselves. But ultimately, um, if I go back to the original study, they said either 55 or 57 percent of all the information we're gathering at any given moment in time is coming to us through these physical pathways, the things that we see uh, our client doing or, or we notice ourselves are doing if we want to stick to the oracle and the self side of things. And then I believe there was, uh, I think it was 37% was attributable to um, the tonal pathway. And so if you ran the math, I think it left you a big whopping, uh, you know, seven or 8% for what the words themselves were actually conveying to you. People lie with their words. It's much more difficult to lie tonally, and it's extremely difficult to lie physically. So you're always revealing a tell. You're always giving the truth away through micro gestures in your body. Yep. Go ahead, Tom. Well, no, I was just saying I'm pretty skilled at lying and uh, keeping my physical nature under control. Well, that's it. It takes great discipline. There are people. I've been practicing since the age of two. I don't think he noticed that I unmuted. 
Yeah, there you go. That's good. But no, it's absolutely true because anyone who has been, I want to say, just wanted to play a good game of poker, they better get good at how they are controlling their physical pathway, uh, that physical pathway. And by the way, you have to be at a certain level of tension to control your physical pathway. Do you think if you're up in stress or down in apathy, you're going to be doing whatever job you can do of managing your physical cues, your physical truth? No. No, you got to be on your game. You got to be out here in power and you'd better not underestimate the challenge that's involved in doing it. or You're going to get sloppy. And what about people who lie to themselves really, really easily or really uh, successfully? You know, it, do they still give ostensive clues and do they still? Uh, they do in their own words. Again, you know, if they're going to be lying to themselves, what they are doing is of uh, in the languaging of the mind they're lying to themselves and i promise you anyone who's lying to themselves still has that little voice sitting on the corner that just says are we the same person because th that wasn't right <laughs> you know so there's always this little whisper that's happening that this lying to oneself is really a coping mechanism uh, to help someone better deal with whatever the stresses, the unknowns, the whatever are that really are, you know, are going on in their life. And I, I also wonder if the professionals on the more, way more experienced people on this call, if they find that their uh, cue reading is hampered by the use of, and I'm serious about this, the use of women are using Botox and you cannot register some of them cannot register surprise yeah i just wonder it, it just is i'm really having a hard time with understanding what people are saying anymore and in, in in teaching um dancing it really came up a lot because you're looking into someone's face and you really i use that for cues a lot of times were they frustrated were they understanding and then all of a sudden slowly and then suddenly most the of faces the faces are frozen right? exactly it's <laughs> freaky too i mean there's it's an it has an effect on me well that's it i mean all of us have to be able to read another person obviously we need to be able to read ourselves that's the point of this but life is about learning how to read other people and then take whatever information you gain through that reading and utilize it in your decisions about how to best interact or proceed or just walk away or whatever but you know you it frustrating yeah, I don't know. We'll uh, let's throw it out to everybody. So let's see. Uh, you know, T and David, Edie. I've never uh, had Tim. that. Is this I've never thing? had the experience. This is T um, personally, and um, or people who've had that. I might just be where I live, but um, I most know. interesting. I will look for that. Nice. It is very, very interesting. But I will say, Andre, that what we all would be detecting is uh, uh, incongruity. So what we're looking for to I decide that, that we're getting a truthful you know, representation of whatever is going on is we're looking to make sure that the information we are gathering through the physical pathway, the tonal pathway, and the verbal pathway are all the same. Um, and so that, that would say the information we're getting is congruent across the three pathways. Well, mm -hmm. if something isn't congruent, like if their, their face might be frozen, but in their words, and perhaps to a somewhat lesser degree, the tonality of the words they're using, they could be giving us information that does not match this motionless face. So, <laughs> but I think, I think then you can say, help me understand what you're feeling. Right. <laughs> Because I can't would, tell. Right. That and, would you know, that gives, yeah. Because that gives them a clue that their, you know, their facial expressions just aren't working. Yeah. And by the way, Andre, we would, uh, T, you can certainly reinforce this if you, if you agree with me. We would also take that opportunity to let them know that if we're confused and are with our professional yeah. training, imagine how the average person interacting with them must be feeling because, you know, we don't notice these cues or we didn't start noticing these cues because somebody invented this. We watch these cues because these cues were discovered. They're, they're common knowledge in, in uh, Changeworks. We would refer to a lot of these things as a blinding flash of the obvious. 
Right, so, but they're hiding it. They're hiding it. They're they're obfuscating it on purpose. And then if they happen to be lying to themselves at the same time, then it's re yeah. you're really you know in a dark alley. Right. So let let me point out that even in your um in you sharing this this uh, scenario with us, you have revealed to all of us that you had a sense beyond what their face was saying or beyond uh, whatever the words are, you picked up on some incongruity uh -huh. in whatever their set of expressions uh, happened to be. Uh, um, and so you're doing the same thing all of us do. And I, I do think it's just a human kind of a thing. You know, we've been, I don't know, maybe it's an instinctual thing. We notice incongruities. Uh, when we're meeting people, it's how we go about sizing up someone so we can figure out, should we trust them? Are they okay? Are they, are they insane? Are they, you know, so I do think at a certain level, it's, in, it's instinctual for us to notice incongruities. Um, but I think that as you live life, and all of us on the call have lived plenty of life so far, um, you can get better and better and better at uh, picking out the the weird ones from the okay ones, you know. <laughs> so, and then you know, again, with equipped with that information, those insights, you get to make a decision and a more informed decision about: Are you going to involve yourself? Not involve yourself? Is this someone? that you want to stay included in your life? Or is this someone who it's time to wish well and let them flow gently down the stream? You know? So, uh, but, but yeah, no, uh, you, you definitely picked up on something that just, you, you went like going back to Sesame Street. One of these things just doesn't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me which one? What doesn't match? What's the incongruity? I love this. Help me understand how you're, help me understand, ask that. I love yeah, that. This always. Our, you know, Andra, our, our work in um, the, all these different human development um, uh, professions that are uh, span across all the members of the circle, um, it, all of them have asking questions in common. Some, some might be clinical psychotherapists and some might be uh, consultants for the accounting side of your business. We still have to ask questions. And it is a skill to be able to ask the right questions and perhaps an even more challenging skill to listen with all of our senses so that we can detect those incongruities. Tim, you've just un unmuted. What would you like to throw in? Sure. So in my work in the DE&I space, uh, this is huge and significant because when we talk about uh, trying to create inclusive organizations where uh, individuals from different backgrounds and parts of the business uh, can feel the values of the business uh, when, the ba when the business is uh, talking about um, that they value people and that they want folks to feel respected that question of feeling and emotion is significant to that con to that conversation because what we find is that everyone doesn't feel uh, what the what the business espouses their values to be because they've had experiences that seem to fall short uh, of the values of the organization so trying to get people to think about and recognize uh, and listen to that response to the question of uh, how do you feel is really, really powerful. Yes. Yep. 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 Well, I don't remember who, who the quote is attributed to. I'm sure one of you guys does, but um, I was at some aquarium somewhere. I don't know. And on the wall with this beautiful mosaic tile, it said something like we must seek to uh, understand yeah. before we seek to be understood. Yeah. It's Stephen Covey. Is that Steve? Is that really Stephen Covey? Because I seem to remember seeing this on uh, the wall at um, the big aquarium at Epcot back when I was in high school. So if it's Covey, yay, good job, Covey. But we need to we we need to understand. And how am I going to understand if I don't ask questions? I mean, yeah, I can pick up information just by observing, mm -hmm. but ultimately there's going to be unanswered questions. And if I can get those questions answered, well. Uh, you know, a whole lot of good things can move from there. 
Okay, anywho, uh, so back to our little stack of layers here. So we do often talk about the merging of these two layers. So the intensities with the levels of tension, um, and uh, you might find this to be a very useful layer. I've not included it in the stack that you can change the backgrounds to on the online system. I certainly could. I could just ask the developers to, to swap out or get, give us a few more graphics in the background anytime uh, we want. I just sit in the the diagram and I don't know, pay them whatever they want. All right. So anyway, so we were looking at these. And by the way, lots of other models divide people into these levels of tension. Oh, that's not true. We divide them into five. Lots of models will talk about three different levels of performance, three different levels of of um, uh, uh, but you know, participation of involvement of whatever. The C zone was one I mentioned, I think, uh, last time around. C zone, peak performance under pressure. They say there is a drone zone, a C zone, and a panic zone. So C zone, panic zone, and, uh, and the C zone is where you're confident and committed and uh, compelled and all that. So that all resonates very well. But there are lots that divide it into the threes. I've always liked to have uh, an appreciation for the gray areas. And so that's how we ended up coming up with a little blend of power and stress to give us power stress and a little blend of power and apathy to give us power apathy. So are you guys feeling how these things all come together? Yeah. Okay, so then the next thing we started looking at were quadrant based, so four type systems. Oh, and by the way, there are other three type systems. So if you guys remember um, the um, somatyping, somatyping, I think, divided humanity into are you an endomorph, a mesomorph, or an ectomorph? So based on body shapes. And then um, at a certain point, that three type model evolved into a nine type model that said that within um, each one of them, there are th at least uh, th there are th three possibilities. So are you um, do you have a large contributing endomorph, a small contributing mesomorph? You know, everyone gets their own little like blend of these three energies. And so they kind of turn that into a little bit of a uh, of a uh, nine type model we can look at a bit later. But anyway, lots and lots of four type models that are out there. So I'm sure you guys have taken the disk profile. You've taken social styles, you've taken relationship strategies, or any one of the countless, countless other uh, four type systems there are. Even if you're a fan of Harry Potter, you know that each one of those houses overlays on one of these areas of the change grid. So, you know, are you a Ravenclaw? Are you a Slytherin? You know, where, where are these houses on the change grid? Where do they plot? Uh, there's countless um, par parlor game kind of quadrant based things that they'll divide you up by the by car types so are you a ferrari are you an edsel i mean are you know so they give you these these crazy things um or it'll be uh you know types of food last time around even mentioned that there was there was a model based on humidity and temperature and if you go all the way back to hippocrates uh, those days you'd find out that your personality would have been named after some some of the what they would call the humors h-u-m-o-u-r-s humors are disgusting body oozes and so are you a sanguine are you a phlegmatic are you a melancholic in which case you'd be uh, having too much black bile and whatever it is it was absolutely disgusting but i think medicine was based on it for a good period of time so anyway Countless, countless models. Well, what we did is we looked at each one of those uh, quadrant-based uh, personality typing systems or temperament or whatever label they wanted to give to it. Uh, we said, what are the adjectives they're using to describe that? And then, well, does the driver use the same adjectives? Does the whatever type, do the, the, the red, does the red do it? If it's the color-based one, the answer was, yeah. There was complete or is complete resonance of the, uh, the, the, the four on top of the four of any other model. You might need to rotate a little bit, but I promise you they're going to overlay just fine. And so we said, well, that would mean that if I'm looking at a particular area of the change grid that's outgrid, I would be able to say if you're plotting outgrid, those adjectives might apply. 
And I had to use the, the might or the could. I had to use something conditional because they change based on where you are in the outgrid quad quadrant. So if you're right here at coordinate seven, seven, are you saying that that is the exact same energy about it, that being up here at a seven eleven or here at an 11, 11 or a 12, 12, all, there's so many spots that are outgrid. Are we supposed to believe that every one of those spots is experienced identically? Of course not. And so if we want to start looking at how those things are different, the first thing we have to do is look at this adjective pile and say some of those adjectives are more outgrid than others are. Some of them have got a little bit of upgrid energy thrown in and we can start subtly shifting each one of those adjectives into an increasingly specific um, um, location that is, it feels increasingly accurate to whatever is going on. And so that's what we did. We slapped them all around all over the place. And um, well, as you start to slap them around all over the place, you learn that the ugly side of those adjectives for each one of those four different types shift increasingly into the danger zones. And so Quite literally, you, we would make a list of all the adjectives that were used to describe a, pers a particular type. And then we would look at those adjectives and say which ones are healthy, which ones are unhealthy. And little by little, all the unhealthy ones shift into the danger zone. And that's why when you look at the adjective map, you'll find that there are far more adjectives available in the danger zones than there are scattered hither and yon uh, throughout the change grid, because the, the people who developed those models tried to keep things 50-50, so 50 negative words and 50 positive words. Well, that's great, but our 50 negative words are all going to cram here, and that leaves 50 to fill up a whole lot of the rest of the space in that particular quadrant. Is that making sense for everybody? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, good. All right, fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, good, good, good. I just, you know, I want to, I want to go through this, this quickly because you really learn about these by looking at change grades and then looking at the layer and saying, well, what information did I get from that layer that could be really useful? Well, one of the things that we did was realize that a lot of the four type systems evolved into five type systems. And for the fifth type, all they did was talk about the one in the exact middle. What's the balance of all these other personalities? What is it if you actually experience harmony and uh, you know balance in your ability to move from one of these types to another type? Uh, that, by the way, added a dynamic element. A great many personality typing systems will tell you that your personality is ingrained at birth and it is very unlikely to ever change. There are other models that say, well, eh, you know, they do change, but they don't change quickly. They change little by little over the course of your lifetime and your whole life experiences and all that are going to redefine how you uh, look at and experience all these different energies. And ultimately you're just now a more skilled, experienced, versed person in all the range. And so some people say, no, your personality it could definitely uh, evolve as time goes on. Some models say that in order for your personality to change more quickly, there has to be what they call a gross pattern interrupt. Something very sudden, almost traumatic, has to um, get just hammered down on you in one fell swoop. And in that one moment, you could very well see a dramatic change in your personality, quite literally, forget overnight, quite literally in the moment. But it has to be something that is very big, very powerful, and in order to do that. But there are some things. And by the way, uh, I talked about it being sudden, but I can also say to you that even though your exposure to this gross pattern interrupt might be a bit longer than immediate, it's not something super long lasting. I'll give you this as an example. Um, if you've ever known someone who was sent to the front lines of battle, you know they didn't come back the same person. 
right? There was some definite changes that you noticed in that person. Well, it's because some sort of trauma occurred. And even now we understand that that as being something that, uh, you know, is a, is a real condition. So that's why we have the post-traumatic stress disorder, which was originally something that was kind of earmarked for people who had gone to war or had had some similar uh, kind of calamity befall them. And then we realized that, no, there are many, many levels at which post-traumatic stress disorder can express itself and many things that can cause it. But the point is that that, um, that stressor can result in an immediate change or a very short-term but powerful change in the case of needing multiple exposures before you're actually going to change. That was a whole lot of words I just used. You guys get it? Thoughts about that? I got a lot of people on the call. So yeah, Tom. Got it. Yeah. You know, T, I think that gross pattern interrupt <clears throat> is an important feature. You know, I, I often run into people who are literally stuck. Yeah. They're stuck in their approach. They're stuck in their patterns. They're stuck in their in their delivery. They're stuck in their minds. And, you know, without some kind of a powerful interruption, you, you can't break through. It's well, it's absolutely true because keep in mind that the word dysfunction still contains the word function. So as screwed up as people are, for the most part, they can all kind of make life still happen and plod their way through. And to David's point, they don't have the awareness. They're not making the kinds of changes that they really need to be made. But nevertheless, uh, they can muddle through. We're not looking at an ideal situation as far as what we hope to achieve for people who are going through the Oracle of the Self and our other trainings. But nevertheless, there's a lot of people out there who are totally whacked out and still they seem to be able to feed themselves. So, uh, yep, David, does that resonate with what you were sharing? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, all right. So, so point is, we, we have a lot that we understand around. Oh, go ahead, uh, Tom Eady. Oh, you know what I was just going to say? I think a lot of times our personality doesn't change as fast or often as mm -hmm. much as our behavior is adaptive to the situation. Right. And, and so it appears to be a personality change when it's really just um, really a spontaneous adaptation, which is which is healthy. And going right. back to the the, you know, the nonverbal cues and stuff, I think when we can't read people, it's often because they're sociopaths. I mean, it's just it's the same reason <laughs> they cannot be detected on a lie detector. There test. you go. Andra, there's your well, that's answer. My, that's exactly my fear. That is exactly, yeah, exactly. you had just touched hard on my deepest mm -hmm. fear about someone. <laughs> Well, keep in mind that the reason why um, sociopaths have become something worth studying is because there are there is a sufficient population of them out there. Right. Um, there yeah. are a lot of sociopaths wandering around this planet. And uh, so how do we go about detecting a sociopath? I promise you, you're going to detect something incongruent in uh, the way they're behaving. And maybe that's the only warning you need moving forward is that the incongruency that means, well, I'm sure what it means at an evolutionary level to all of us is pay attention, take care, take notice. You know, uh, so we're coming to us as an alert or a warning as opposed to a run, run now, run fast. You know, and I think, you know, T, the, the interesting thing with sociopaths is with a certain level of tension it's almost a break point for them. You know what I mean? Where the mass falls, you yeah, know? They can only maintain yeah. it. And again, if we go back to looking at the levels of productive tension, if you want to pull off being a really good sociopath, where do you have to be on the change grid? Apathy? Nope, because in apathy, what would happen to your attention to detail? Oh. You know, so because yeah. think about this. Well, they're, they're basically out grid, aren't they? They're outgrade, but are they in power? See, this is my thought. I believe that sociopaths are solidly in power, outgrid, and spend a great deal of time in the danger zone. Mm -hmm. But they're able to put a face on that allows all of us to see someone who might be at six degree intensity where a lot of good things could be happening uh, if you got that kind of energy and power. But uh, they're really, they're out here and they're just managing uh, those behind them as effectively as they can. We've talked that, about that before, that the, the further outgrid you go, the more you victimize those that are in grid. 
And mm -hmm. if you're victimizing, if you're a seven, it's easiest to victimize the people closest to you or to manipulate the people that are closest to you. Um, and I guess, Anidi, this is really for you. Who else is a clinic? Oh, T, you're a clinical psychologist, I do believe. Or I forget what your PhD is in, but somewhere along there. Um, do you think that a sociopath is aware of the fact that they're a sociopath? No. No. That is a great question that I've wondered for years. If they're aware of it, then they could be doing it deliberately. To me, they're far more dangerous than the sociopath who's just out there being whatever their chemistry is making them be. You know, you I honestly think different? so. I think so often, T, that they believe in their own lies, that they actually become mesmerized by their own falsehoods. I really do. But are exactly. they aware? Are exactly. they aware that they are lies? Are they aware that these are falsehoods? Or is it their truth inside of their, um, you know? I, I honestly think for some it becomes their truth. Yeah. Well, what's the difference? Well, so, again, I mean, is, as it, an is it lying to yourself, trying to convince yourself of that? And isn't that why people lie to themselves? They're trying to convince themselves of something? What they're trying to do is escape their pain. Yeah. This is yeah. an avoidance behavior. So they don't feel good about They have very low self-esteem. They're very far in grid. And because of this in-grid thing, keep in mind that the in-grid danger zone is physically adjacent to the out-grid danger zone. And so they may very well, sorry about that, they may very well be feeling internally very submissive, worried, unsure, reticent, all these words, fragile, pallid, et cetera. But they may, may then be presenting themselves as the other extreme. Hmm. So... Yeah, but what you're looking at, though, see, for all of us, when we hear about someone who is in this state of mind, we go like, oh, business opportunity. How can we fix them? You know, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know when we're tra training this program to, to, you know, people just live in their life, we really should make sure we point out to them that what they need to do is ask first and foremost, do I need to be around this individual? You know, is this individual optional in my life? And if they are, then choose accordingly, you know, because you're under no obligation to fix this person. But and if you have true, if you truly have love for a person and you see that they have a problem, it's uh -huh. it's not easy to, and, and also just someone in pain, just someone who you think yeah. that, that, I mean, isn't that what you're seeing in them that, that they're in pain? I mean, when you see that, you want to try to help. Well, they're not in pain as they perceive it, though. They're not. They're, they are basically insulating themselves from the experience yeah. of their pain yeah. and putting forth this. Uh, well, again, remember, uh, you know, they're sociopathic. So they're, you know, they're most definitely doing something that to an outside observer would, um, I don't want to say doesn't make sense because it does make sense once you understand what you're really looking at. You're looking at a very, very disturbed person. Right. And even if you love them, I will tell you that many, many people who have sociopaths, say, say for example, in their family, um, sooner or later, you might have to stage an intervention. Um, but you've got to decide, is that intervention something that is but, doing it? But T, is that intervention going to, I, I just don't, you know, those character disorders are not, Right, but if uh, that intervention gets them into a facility, uh, yeah, yeah, that that okay. Right, but one person see. saying to them, you know, honey, you're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's not going to be it. But if you get the people that that individual knows, loves them, and cares about them, you get those people together with the assistance of a professional interventionist. <laughs> you might have a chance of getting them uh, into uh, to step in the right direction. But uh, an if you know of that being successful, let me know. And I think we should all do a study of OJ Simpson. He just, you know, he, he just keeps popping his head. He did again the other day. He had an opinion on what was it. Yeah. And, and it's almost like they, they, the, the, they are so addicted to the dopamine that they get yes. from the challenge of tricking everybody that whether he gets caught stealing his own souvenirs or whatever, they can't stop. 
You know what I mean? Right. And keep in mind that dopamine is the award is the reward for everyone who's in the danger zones. Mm -hmm. Adult, how you get there might answer a question about why the dopamine get triggered, uh, but definitely all of the things that pull people into a danger zone and keep them into the danger zone is going to get back to this. Well, it's going to get back to uh, any of the addictive processes, that sort of thing. They're addicted to dopamine because we all are. We all are. So, okay. Uh, la, 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 la. T, did you unmute it? Did you want to throw something in? Um, I was just going to say that sometimes when we think we're helping people, we have to consider our own risk. And I think it's more about us. It's, yep. you know, it's more about us than it is about that person. Yeah. And we have to consider when we should not do that. Yep. 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 And that's why, oh. you know, the first question you got to ask yourself is like, do you need, really need to have this person? In your, is this, you know, do you have to fix this? Can't you just avoid it? I mean, if it's a family member, that's a tough thing to do. Or if it's a coworker, that's a tough thing to do. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah. And she's so right. I just got a death threat last night. I think he's bipolar more than sociopathic, but he had been in prison because I unintentionally guess. he felt, believe, yeah. <laughs> And, and so, you know what, it's not worth, he owes me, but you know what, I'm backing <laughs> off because I got too much to do before I die. But you're after, <laughs> you know, we do have to weigh it out when there's, yeah, it's not worth it. Yeah, it's just not, it's just, and that's why really if, okay, so Anja, if you were to come to any of us as a client and have a discussion with us around us, we would spend far more time early on talking to you about you than about who this other person is and what their what their issues happen to be. You know what I mean? Because we want to make sure that you are as solid as you can be so that you can make that choice about whether or not it really is worth the pursuit. I mean, does this person genuinely mm -hmm. deserve right. your level of attention, you know? Whatever. I do get that. But it's just, it's so difficult to just it's, say, I don't need it, you in my life when I... Yeah, yep, yep, yep. In which case we would say, well, then we let's see what we could do to help you develop a, an extra uh, skill or two to help you be in that environment with them while they're doing whatever it is they do and still be able to maintain your zen. Because you know? <laughs> it's really about how, do, how can we help you stay at the, well, I could do this as a quiz question, but you need to be inside the green circle. You need to be at that purple point. Mm -hmm. and when you're around sociopaths, I promise you, they're either frightening you uh, or they're irritating the daylights out of you and compelling you to want to get into a bit of a battle with them. Um, they might be boring you to tears, but you're in a situation where you can't just fall asleep, which is what you're going to do. Um, but in grid, no, they'd have to be really overpowering. And I know you enough to know that, that this is not the effect they're going to have on you. So... You got but what about the manipulation? I don't hear you saying that, T. Which you know about, what? About them manipulating you. Because I, you know, yeah. just look at the prisoners that get the guard, the female guards. Oh, of course. Yeah. Bring them whatever and do whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the manipulation is just yeah. such a part. You yeah. know, that's again, when instead of just talking about someone being a sociopath, I want to add the word kind of mastermind. Mm -hmm. what they're doing they're an evil mastermind are they so evil they don't realize they're an evil mastermind it's just who they are maybe um but in which case they would do the same things that you would do if you were pretending to be a mastermind to do this you know these are the evil 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 incarnate possibilities and so you know t i think that's when they have that breaking point that when they're confronted, they, you know, like you said, they're just holding on yeah. to their facade. And when, when you start challenging too much, that's when they explode. That, that's right. when they'll make the death threat. That's when they'll, yep. That's right. And it's because of two things that are happening at that particular point in time. I'm looking for the right diagram to show you guys so we can really help you get comfortable looking at all these. What you've just described is what that person is likely to do when they're in the outgrid danger zone and they realize they've been exposed as being this yeah. person who might be delusional, who might be um, 
truly to be feared or whatever it is, they've now been exposed. We've seen them. The mm -hmm. first thing you will see, and I'll put money on this, is they're just going to become even more of an outgrid danger zone. Mm -hmm. so they're going to fight harder, mm -hmm. they're going to push back stronger, become more manipulative. They could become all brutal and all those words we have in the outgrid danger zone. But when they realize that that is not going to work, that their attack, the attack on them is going to continue, do not be at all surprised if they suddenly present themselves as being the victim. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a second. So people yeah. don't understand it. The only reason why all this stuff is happening that upsets me is because um, uh, people are just trying to get back at whatever. They don't understand, blah, blah, blah. And so they'll present themselves as being the victim in there. Mm -hmm. And now I've got the other extreme to deal with. Absolutely. Oh, yep. I do that. But the thing I know for certain is on the way between the outgrade danger zone and the in-grid danger zone, they did not go through the center of the change grid. They did not find a place of peace on their way to the in-grid danger zone. They came at it through the back door. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and by the way, we've been talking about outgrid and uh, and uh, in-grid. Keep in mind, they'll suddenly show upgrid behaviors, become very angry, reactive, uh, alarmist, uh, haphazard, unpredictable. Um, uh, delusional doom, or they'll even be downgraded. At a certain point, they'll give up, and suddenly they'll go quiet on you. You won't hear their fights anymore. You'll see that in their whole physiology, they've moved very, very far into the victim appearance mm -hmm. or into the downgrade appearance. Hey. Yes, this is Susan. Am I missing something? Um, why haven't we encouraged? whoever this woman is, to report this person. She's, they made a death threat on her life. Oh, that's Edie. Edie, did they really mm -hmm. threaten you? And are you taking them seriously? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm honestly concerned that being bipolar and the impulsiveness I know in bipolars, that it could be, I, 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 my wise instinct is to say, just cool it down, de-escalate. And if, if it escalates... Um, I honestly, yeah, but if it escalates, you could be dead. Yeah. No, it, if it escalates, <laughs> I could be dead, which is why I'm not pushing it. Exactly. I'm not going to raise his tension because he could explode and then do it. So and I'm fine. And, uh, Susan, but you need to report this to the authorities. Somebody made it. If somebody was uh, to report I, it and not do anything. I, I yeah. Would, it might I be good to have it on it. record. Yeah. Right, but if they're going to go and investigate it, you've just raised their level of tension. and Exactly. Yep. So here's the thing. I just look kind of, because Susan, you are correct, but I will tell you that the, the sweeping majority of these kinds of threats are never reported for because the degree to which we take it seriously is a wide range. I know, and, but that's how we find out all, about all these people afterwards, after they do mass shootings, after they do all this crap, because nobody called and said, hey. Right, but even you know, if even someone if they called, don't do anything, they right, have right, a record. Right. right, but even if we called and said what was going on, the only thing we have available to send out to them at this point, if, the, if such a thing was made, is police. This person is not going to be fixed by the police. They I might know. be restricted. No, I know that, but, but I know that, but they don't necessarily do that. They, you know, I, I don't know. I have a minor police background, but yeah. at least somebody might investigate, but not with this person. They're not, in my opinion, I don't know if it was me. I wouldn't go and confront this person but I certainly would check the record and I certainly would have. Well, he's been in prison for 25 years. Yeah, so the something. point, yeah, point, yeah. You know, point well made. And I, you're absolutely, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And Edie, I'll remind you of the opening scenes in um, Sixth Sense. Do you remember mm -hmm. that movie? Mm hmm. So mm -hmm. although people forget it, don't really realize it, and then they're surprised at the end, okay, he got killed right then and there by a, by a distraught former patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the same, same sort of a thing, but, you know, you got to take it really seriously. Now, mm -hmm. I want to throw this back to, uh, 
to uh, Tom and Anja for just a second. So do you guys feel any actual threat in this individual or is it really just more that they drive you nuts stage? Um, well, drive you nuts. Yeah, a little bit of threat, but not physical threat. Yeah, you're not taking them seriously. You know, their, their threats are not. Mm-hmm. anything like that see i would say that most of us on the call have had have been threatened at one point or another the story i could tell you tom and Anja know about the story but yeah there's someone who threatened me in a very big way decided to take uh some action failed in that attempt and was in prison for almost 40 years oh that's right and he was going to get released remember that team? oh he has been he has been released but as far as i'm aware uh he's decided he doesn't want to go back in but for all i know you know covid got him i've got no idea it doesn't really matter my point is is that <laughs> this idea about being threatened is a very real part of human life and uh, we have to all then decide. I was going, when this whole thing first started, I was going and seeing detectives and things like that saying to them, this person is someone who's very volatile. They're very whatever. And they said to me, we can make a record of it, but until someone actually does something, Mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing that we can really do. So- And then it's too late, yep. Well, luckily for me, <laughs> he tried to hire an undercover state trooper who had been alerted uh, to this particular thing and whatever it is. It all turned out just fine. I'm still here, whatever yeah. it is. But anyway, a very interesting kind of a thing. But I just want to make sure Tom and Anja, we did spend a moment just to say, is this person really being um, you know, threatening in any kind of way? Or is it just a no. big, they're a big pain in your butt right now? <laughs> Okay, uh, look, it's the top of the hour. Uh, I think we've made some good progress talking about these layers, but there are a few other layers I'd like to uh, to make sure I address with you guys. And so we'll do that coming up on our next call. In the meantime, if you've got any questions or anything, never hesitate to reach out and give us a call or send us an email. We'll be more than happy to have a nice long discussion with you. So send you a fax. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a fax. we don't even have <laughs> We don't even have a scanner anymore now. I'm thinking about it. Do you still have your beeper? Oh, you know, I liked my beeper. I thought that was one of the... Because <laughs> it vibrated. But you can actually do it. Uh, you can get, yeah, there you go. You can get a beeper um, app for your iPhone and it serves as a, as a you know, I, it behaves as a beeper, even though you could just do that by sending a text message. If you I'd rather to. stick needles in my eyes. No, yeah, I had, right. I had to have one for 10 years at work and I never learned how to properly use it yeah no 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 wouldn't no. you just put the your cell phone on vibrate and be the same thing well, exactly be the same thing but if you wanted to make all those cute little uh beeper tones and have the little message go scrolling across you could actually put an app on your phone no but i i remember i had a beeper and i got a text a beep for uh, a message from my wife at the time saying 911 oi yeah, and I was, you know, like 30 miles away and at lunch with a client and I left immediately and called her on the way and one of our sons had had a seizure. Oh, no. And they were going to the hospital. So uh, I, that's my last memory of having a beeper. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Phones, phones are the way these days. Um, okay, anyway, do feel free to reach out, ask any questions. I'd like to finish these remaining layers. Uh, so that when I come back from the cruise, we can get you started on uh, your next actual change grid. And by then, I'm hoping you guys will feel comfortable doing a little bit of reading of grids for yourself. And uh, uh, I'll be here to help guide you. To find You're going on a cruise? Where are you going? I leave from Miami and we cross the Atlantic and I end up in London on uh, two days before the coronation. Wow. Yeah, oh, so wow. Across, it's a transatlantic repositioning of a ship. So our calls are canceled for a while? Well, no, I'll go ahead and do them. Uh, what I always like to do is say, I'm going to leave them all in the schedule. But when I'm in the middle of the ocean on eight sea days, sometimes the internet gets mighty dicey. And so yeah. I'd still like to keep our calls going because I find them very enjoyable to do. And if, you, if I got a sea day on a cruise ship, well, I got plenty of time to do a call, you know? But, but T, I didn't know you were being you were being coronated. 
Oh, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, you know, I mean, I don't want people to think that, you know, we're trying to like brag or anything like that, but, you know. It has a nice ring to it. It does, yes. I'm being co coronated. Oh, I guess I'm being crowned. <laughs> crowned. That's not the right verb. You're being crowned in a coronation. A four, in a coronation. Yes. And when are you going? Uh, what's that? When are you going? I leave a week from uh, Wednesday, uh, the 19th. And you know how you always come in a day early before you get on the cruise ship. The ship actually leaves on Thursday, the 20th. And then I return on May 4th. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, it's about a two week overall trip, all things put together. But like I said, I'm more than happy to try to do the calls, but if I'm in the middle of the ocean, no guarantees. And you guys would be shocked at how much internet costs on the ships now. Uh, even with my frequent traveler discount on it, I'm still paying $35 per device per day. Oh, to be on high speed. Really? Wow. Really? And you can't just get it for one day on the fly. You got to get it for the entire cruise. That's thirty-five dollars times thirteen days. Wow, so wow. that's wow. over almost four hundred and fifty dollars for internet for one. Wow, cruise. isn't that insane? Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. Well, what works well though is you know Diane still sees clients and she'll see half a dozen clients a day, so she's pulling in whatever her hourly rate is times five or six. So for her to spend the thirty five dollars uh, is no big deal at all. And what mm -hmm. she usually does is say that when she's not using it for her clients, I can use it for whatever I want. So it's not like it's locked on one device. You basically have a one device account, but you can change the device as many times as you want on the fly. So oh, that's good. Yeah. So it really is just about coordinating things with Diane to see if I can use her because she's going to get it one way or another anyway. The woman makes a profit on a cruise. So yeah, it's all good. It's all good. So all Linda right. isn't going. You're going with Diane again, huh? You're yeah, bumping the Diane. Yeah, I'm going with Diane. This is a uh, she's lecturing on board, and you guys know the situation. Diane's one of my very closest, closest friends, um, and um, you know she loves cruising, and it costs her nothing to bring someone with her. So I'm happy to be the freebie. So I keep telling you, I'll carry your luggage for you. There you go. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank oh, you. Day, okay. Thank you. Bye Very now. informative today. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye. 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 Look over yeah. your shoulder. Look over your shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> exactly.